church. How are we doing this morning? Hey, let's go ahead and stand together and leave. let's sing about the miracles of our God. It's miracles when you move, such an easy thing for you to do. In your hand is moving right now. And you are still showing up at the tomb of every Lazarus. And your voice is calling me out. And right now, I know you're in. Treasures of faith 
guys can be seated. Welcome back. We hope that you all have enjoyed worship as you've just stepped into it. I know that I have. Oh yeah, I was kind of bummed we didn't make the worship set, but yeah, it's okay. Yeah, haven't, haven't quite made the cut. It's okay, next Sunday. But I, there's always a chance. It's always a chance. That, that we're gonna get to be the backup dancers. It's okay, okay. just mute my mic. It's fine, right? Just mute the mic, worship. it's cool. It's cool, uh, but uh, before we head right back into worship, we, uh, we again, just want to welcome you here. We are so thankful you're here, glad you're here, and we hope that you've had a chance to invite people, uh, invite someone to be a part of the service with you. After all, we are in week two of our new series, On Map, On Mission. Or better yet, known as... Um, he's never, he's never going to let that one go. Um, nah. <laughs> oh, <I'm> anyway, <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> so good. Look, um, not only do you as adults have an opportunity to invite people, uh, invite your friends and family to our worship services, but we've actually launched a lot of our fall programming for our students and our kids ministries, meaning that, uh, people of all ages actually have the opportunity to invite others into meaningful relationships. And one of the things that we actually launched le- like this past Wednesday, this past Wednesday, a couple days ago, a couple days ago, we launched our newest preteen ministry. Um, they have an incredible Wednesday night program and it's for our fourth through sixth graders. So if you didn't get to check it out and you've got a fourth through sixth grader, get them here next week. Um, Miss Hannah is back leading the way on that. We're so thankful. Uh, She is so passionate about making sure that our preteens know Jesus and learn to follow him. So uh, 6.30 is when the doors open for our preteen ministry. It ends about eight o'clock and it's on the third floor in the zone. Get your kid there. Don't don't meet us there, beat us there. Beat us there, right, I love that. I heard they had a blast. I love that. (laughs) They stay in the zone. (laughs) Or you need to stay yeah. in the yeah, zone. Yeah, I need to stay in the zone. Okay, okay focus. And, and one more thing that we have for you. Uh, last week, we introduced you to Richie. He's one of our VIPs, and we're so thankful for him living on map and on mission right here. So this week, check out our next VIP. <sighs> When I think about a volunteer VIP, I can't go any farther than thinking about Ben and Dorothy Canales. They exemplify this word what I call faith. Faithful, available, intentional, teachable, and humble. They show up, they put their full heart into it, and man, they love people. Man, yes, let's celebrate that. It's a joy to serve in the house of the Lord, and so grateful to celebrate that. Ever be 
Here's what the prophet Isaiah says in chapter 53, verses 4 through 12. Surely he took on our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquities of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter as a sheep before its shearers is silent so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away, yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living for the transgressions of my people, he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his, in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet, the Lord's, yet, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sins of many and made intercession for the transgressors. That's the word of the Lord. Amen, church. Yeah. I hear the Savior say Thy strength indeed is small Child of weakness, watch him pay. Find in me an all in all. Jesus paid it all. All to him, my Lord. For sin had left a crimson stain. He was in white. Crimson 
himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness by his wounds you have been healed and so church this is our god and so as an act of just solid surrender can we just lift our hands to him and can we praise our king a king who paid a debt that we could never pay and so church let's read this aloud together it says again he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness by his wounds you have been healed let's praise our king together oh praise the have a seat right there where you are. Man, I don't know if you remember it. Uh, we've talked about it several months ago about the importance of rehearsing the gospel in our lives. And uh, as I sing the words of that old hymn, it just reminds me of the sin that so easily wraps me up, right? It tangles me. It just wraps chains around my legs. Sometimes I walk around with it when God has freed me by the power of Jesus. And uh, I don't know about you, but that's a great reminder for my soul that Jesus paid it all. Sin had left a stain, but he washed it white. And too often I try to go back and be identified by the things that I do wrong. I try to be identified by the gap. But in Jesus, there's no gap. I just stand here forgiven as a son. Anybody feel good about that reality today? It's good. Maybe you walked in today and you're like, hey, I'm not real sure what you're talking about. Listen, I think that God has a word for you today. Pastor Scott is gonna be communicating with us about the, yeah, yep, yeah, got some real big fans of Scott Rogers, me too. And so excited to hear what God's gonna share through him. We're gonna take just a second. And before I pray, I just wanna remind you the different ways that you can bring an offering to the Lord. Uh, if you're watching online, you can do that one of uh, two ways there. You can either text the number that's on the screen. You can mail a check into the address that's on the screen. If you are on campus, if you're in the room today, uh, you see the boxes to the left and the right, right there by the doors, you can drop your offering there. And uh, I just remind us when we bring an offering to God, the reason we do it is it makes a declaration that he is the priority of life. Even in the things that we have, we begin with him. It all begins with him. He's fully sufficient for everything that we need. And he's the provider of our needs. Amen to that, all right? So I'm gonna pray. 
and then we're gonna give a big, crazy welcome to Pastor Scott, all right? And when I say crazy, I need the people watching online to hear how crazy it is in this room. Nine o'clock, are you with me? All right. God, thanks for this morning, for your spirit in this place, and for the reminder, the gentle reminder, God, through that beautiful song, through that beautiful song, you have paid our debt. You have raised us from the grave, and we get to live in kingdom life, even now. And we worship you this morning and praise you. I pray for Scott. I pray, God, that you would anoint his words. We ask you to teach us, and we are here to receive. We pray it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, give it up for Pastor Scott, everybody. Good morning. This is a loud and rowdy crowd here in the house today. Come on. I set you up. I give you an opportunity to make some noise. Come on, Matt. Let's make some noise this morning. You guys glad to be in church? Hey, would you all welcome me and my welcoming to everyone joining us right now at Church Online and Facebook Live. So glad that you're inviting us into wherever you are. We're thrilled to be a part of uh, one big family with you. Come on, the mat. Let's give a big hand for everyone joining us online this morning. This is so good to, to be with you guys. My name is Scott Rogers, and I, I got to tell you, I don't know where you guys are uh, viewing from. In fact, wherever you are right now, just type in where you are, what city you're in, what town you're in, maybe even what country you're in. We'd love to know that because right here in Houston, I think spring is in the air. Do you guys feel this? This is awesome. It's under 100. We're not sweating. We walk outside at 6 a.m. I am loving it, loving it. Well, we're in a series called On Map and On Mission. And if you have a Bible with you, open it up to 1 Timothy chapter 2. That's 1 Timothy chapter 2. And in this series, what we're doing is we're literally unpacking in detail the mission statement of the Met. We're looking at why is this important? Why do we focus on this? Why do we want to live this out? And what I want to do is I want to get all of your participation, you online as well. We're going to talk through or read aloud our mission statement for just a moment, okay? So we're going to put it on the screen, and I want you to read this with me. Our mission is this, inviting Hold on. That was really underwhelming. You guys ready this time? I'll go a little bit slower on the count of three. One, two, Walt Stratton, where are you? You, you got it. Okay, one, two, three. Inviting people into meaningful relationship with God and each other. Everybody say, got it. This is what we're all about as a church. Inviting people into meaningful relationship with God and each other. And I love in this series on map on mission, the tagline is wherever I am, there it is. Wherever you and I find ourselves in life, regardless of the circumstance, the calling of God on our life as a church and even as individuals is to be on mission, inviting people into meaningful relationship with God and each other. Back in uh, June of 2019, I, I was on one of my favorite hikes in the Sierras, just south of Lake Tahoe. I got to be honest, now living in Houston, the thing that I miss most about living in California is my inability to drive an hour east and be in the mountains and go for a hike. And on this mountain right here, I, I took the, uh, the obligatory selfie at the top of this. This is Mount Ralston. And it's not very high. It's like 9,600 feet. But Mount Ralston, it's called, it's called the thigh burner of Lake Tahoe because it's only three and a half miles up from the trailhead, but it's about 2,800 feet of a climb. So it's, it's a pretty steep grade in that short distance. And I get to the top, and as you can kind of tell in the background, the snowpack in 2019 was pretty good. This is late June, and I am on the top and just kind of hanging out. I eat lunch, and all of a sudden, uh, some weather starts to blow in. And when I say blow in, the wind can pick up really fast in this area. And it starts to gust maybe 30, 40 miles an hour. It gets really cloudy. And I'm thinking, I'd better get down from here. I did something really super smart for mountain climbing or just hiking. I, I went by myself. No one else is up there but these little critters. And uh, you can see behind me, you can see Lake Tahoe a little bit in the background there. 
And I'm thinking, I better get out of here before it starts raining or even worse. And so I, I turn around, I start to head down, and the next picture is, is basically what I see. It's, it's, a, it's, it's all snow, and thank goodness I had my trekking poles. But as I begin my descent, I'm like, I want to go really fast. And so I start going, and I, I don't know what the trail is. I have no idea. And if I get off trail, off the path, I could go over this side of the mountain, that side, not off a cliff, I'm smarter than that, but I could end up in a really bad place. And so what I did, because I didn't know where to do, and I'm thinking, I'm just, maybe this is it. I get to die a grand death on the top of a mountain, and maybe someone would write a story about it, but I thought, nah, maybe for another day. So I pull out my All Trails app on my phone, and what I do is I take that little, the app, and I, and I zoom in on my trail, on the path that I took. I literally step by step, was holding the app like this on my phone and walking down until I got out of the snow. It was concerning for about 10 minutes, maybe more. But what was beautiful was even when I lost my way and I lost the trail, I just looked at the app and it showed me the steps to take. And that is the very same thing that happens for you and for me and for us as a church, whenever we lose the trail, maybe the weather has gone crazy, little things now and then like pandemics and life circumstance disorient us, and we're not sure what step to take, when we're clear on our mission, we know the direction to go. And when we talk about being on map and on mission, Having a sense of what God has called us to is of the utmost importance. And so what I have the opportunity to do today is to share with you one of the specifics of this mission statement. In fact, let's put it back up on the screen again and take a look at what it is. Our mission is inviting who? Inviting? People. Inviting who? People. Inviting people into meaningful relationship with God and each other. Look to the person sitting next to you or six feet from you and say, hey, you're a people. So we're talking about you. Today we're talking about inviting people into meaningful relationship with God and each other. Let me show you something uh, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3 through 6. Here's what scripture says to us. This is good and pleases God our Savior who wants who? Who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Verse five, for there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for who? All people. He gave himself as a ransom for all people. He gave himself as a ransom for my people, for your people, for all people. He gave himself as a ransom for Big Sean, Post Malone, Ariana Grande as a ransom for Donald Trump, Joe Biden, and Nancy Pelosi. He gave himself as a ransom for Serena Williams, Deshaun Watson, and Brad Kilgore. <laughs> he even gave himself as a ransom for Dallas Cowboys fans. which just goes to prove that Jesus loves everyone <laughs> and can save anyone. He really does. He loves everyone and can save anyone. Let me ask us this question. Why are people such a big deal to God? Maybe make it more personal for a moment. Why are you such a big deal to God. I think scripture give us, gives us some insight. Let me show you. Psalm chapter eight, verse three through five. The, the writer says this, when I consider the heavens, when I consider the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, then he says this, what is mankind that you are mindful of, him, of them human beings that you care for them. And it's as if God the Spirit gives him the insight. Verse five, he says, you've made them a little lower than the angels. Look to the person next to you and say, you're not quite an angel, 
but I still love you. Then say, if you behave one, no, forget, let's not go there. It says, you've made them humankind, people, men, women, boys and girls. You've made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. That's you. Humankind, dwarfed by the universe, and yet the crown of creation. It's amazing. Look at Genesis 1 real quick. Verse 26. It says this. And God said, let us make mankind in our image. Just a real quick side note. You notice it says let us. That's the very first reference to the Trinity in the Bible. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Let us make mankind in our image. And then it goes on to say in our likeness. Verse 27. It says, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. He created them. This is something I I think, I say this sincerely. Some of us need to hear what I'm about to say. Even when you don't believe in God, he believes in you. Even when your faith is shaken, God's resolve to love you stands firm. Even when we struggle in our faith, even if we don't believe, God still believes in you and in me. He's made us in his image. And if people are the mission of God, then people are the mission of the Met. I remember kind of looking back on my journey at kind of being on the receiving end of a mission-minded people. And what I mean by that is um, just some real quick scenarios. When I was a a little kid in our neighborhood, one of our our neighbors in a rural uh, neighborhood in Michigan, they were Christians. And I knew it because they'd talk about their faith and other things that were just strange and foreign to me. And I once went to church with them, which was a very strange and foreign experience. And then later in my life, in junior high, one of my best friends was a Christian and in a Christian family. And so they invited me to church. And that, again, was a very strange experience for me. My freshman, one of my freshman uh, teachers in high school was a Christian. And he invited me and a few of uh, my friends to uh, an event one night. And we actually went and there, all I remember was there was a band, so there was music, and then there was like some guy that was yelling at us. It was just kind of a weird, weird deal. But God had sent people on mission to try to reach me. One time, he had sent some people on mission to me when I was at a KISS concert. Now, if you're under 35 or unfamiliar with good music, you may not know who KISS is. I was actually going to put a picture on the screen to show you who they are, but I thought you might send some uh, email that, you know, like, oh, why are we doing that at church? By the way, if I say anything that frustrates you, that you want to complain about, my email address is matt at the met.church. Send away. It's all good. Okay? So I held back on the kiss picture. I'm at a kiss concert, and I don't know how this happened, but because I don't remember a whole lot. But I got kicked out of the KISS concert. Now, how many people in the world can hold that honor of literally being so rowdy, you're kicked out of a KISS concert? One of your pastors. And literally, these these big guys, like, Bring, they cart me through the auditorium, down this hall, and lie. I don't even remember like what it, if it was a forceful shove. All I know is there's a side door in a big arena, and I'm out on the sidewalk. And I, if I'm lying, I'm dying. Total truth. I end up in the middle of a circle of these Jesus people holding signs. They're like, turn or burn, you know, John 3, 16, believe and receive. And they got a bullhorn like those people. God loves you, you're going to hell kind of thing. <laughs> Outside of a KISS concert. And I'm sitting on the sidewalk going, uh, what in the world? And one of the guys comes up to me and just starts talking to me, sharing the gospel with me. 
I don't remember how I felt or what I thought, and you can assume why I didn't. We'll leave that out of the conversation. But God was sending people on mission to reach me. But it really wasn't until I was in close relationship with some people that God got through. I remember this elderly lady named Nancy. I was working in this big restaurant and she ran the bakery. And Nancy was a Jesus follower. And I would come in on like Sunday mornings or whatever, cook, you know, I was a cook at this restaurant and she would ask me how I was doing and what was going on in my life and I would tell her about my escapades, you know, the Kiss concert escapades and other things that would keep me out till seven o'clock on Sunday morning. And she would just innocently and sweetly say, oh, Scott, Jesus loves you so much. I'm praying that God gets your heart. And then she would just love on me and we'd have a fun conversation. She did it all the time. She was really the first tangible um, or the first personality that really represented grace to me. And then there was my friend Todd who led me to Christ, who uh, we were close in close relationship. And here's the thing. For you and for me, as we live out this mission of inviting people into meaningful relationship with God and each other, we need to realize not everyone will believe, but all are invited. It's not your responsibility or my responsibility what someone chooses to do with the life we live in front of them or the message that we share. It's our responsibility to give the invitation. Inviting people into meaningful relationship with God and each other. Not everybody's gonna believe, but let's extend the invitation anyway. And here's what happened to me, the same as what happened to many of you online and many of us in the room, is this. Romans chapter 10, verse 12 and 13. We get to this place where we accept the invitation. Here's what God's word says. For there's no difference between Jew and Gentile. That's basically just meaning all people. It says the same Lord is Lord of who is Lord of? There's that word again. Lord of all and richly blesses, there it is, richly blesses all who call on him for, come on God, you're just being so redundant here, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone. And here, here's where I struggle. Um, I struggle personally and I think every single church eventually struggles as an organization. Not in that we don't know this stuff. Not that we don't believe it, but we become apathetic. I know I do. I lose this sense of urgency in my own life, in my own faith, to live out this mission that God has called me to. Uh, Mike Turk, one of the pastors on our, our leadership team here at the Met, often says to us or brings up the conversation about what he calls spiritual intensity. And he just so rightly reminds us that in our own personal journey and as a church, we need to keep that spiritual intensity to not become apathetic to our calling and our mission. And I had an experience this year that was incredibly spiritually intense. I was, uh, my wife and I, Shelly, were doing some work with a church in Boise, Idaho. In fact, I think the weekend before in January, I was right here. I came out to just hang out and check out the grand opening of, of the, this facility. But then the following weekend, we were in Boise and uh, um, I wasn't feeling good. I was at the church services and we had some meetings later on that day. So we left in the middle of the second service, had never been to Boise. And so I thought, let's go get something to eat and uh, let's go towards downtown and just check out, you know, the state capital of Boise, Idaho. And so we're driving down the highway. It's a cold, rainy day. In five, 10 minutes in the drive, our son Dylan 
sends me this text. January 26. And I'll tell you, I had to pull over. I was shocked. Kobe was one of my heroes. I think I've watched every interview he's ever done, listened to every podcast he's ever been on, and there was something about Kobe that just inspired me. In fact, um, you know, they called it the Mamba attitude. And what he did on the court is without debate. And what he did off the court into retirement is truly inspiring. If you've never seen any of his work, just YouTube, Hello Basketball. And the things he was doing just continued to be amazing. And I remember sitting, we pulled off an exit, and I got on my phone and I started just going, it's, it can't be true. It can't be true. And I was, I was, I was rendered um, useless for the rest of the day. And I'm just going to be vulnerable for a moment. It's weird. I just say it right out front. This is weird. I wept over Kobe's death every day for two weeks. And I can't explain entirely. I can't, I'm going to try to explain it here, but I can't explain fully why. Um, on Wednesday of that week, so it would be like January 29, I had some work to do in Los Angeles, and I drove down, and I stayed at a friend's house in Irvine. And uh, this married couple were, was traveling that, at that time, and they said, Scott, just stay at the house. You can have the whole house to yourself. It was awesome. And, um, and so yeah, I'm doing this work during the day, and I come back to the house, and you know, every day I'm, I'm like, not publicly, but privately, just, just crying over Kobe's death. I'm grieving. And then I remember Friday night, the night before I was to drive back, uh, was the first game the Lakers played after Kobe's death. And I'm not even a Lakers fan, okay? So just don't hold that you know, this against me. I'm not, I'm not a, just a fan of Kobe. And I remember sitting, watching the um, kind of a memorial that they had before the game at Staples Center. And I just, I just start bawling like a baby. I'm talking like gut type of crying. And I'm literally, I start praying I'm like, God, what is going on? Why do I feel this way? I mean, granted, I don't, totally my opinion, I don't think the world has grieved the death of one person this deeply since Princess Diana. Maybe Michael Jackson. But this, he was invincible. As we, so many of us thought. And I am weeping and I'm praying and here's what happened. And I'm not trying to be a preacher here. I'm telling you, this is really my experience. And I am praying and, and like, well, God, what's going on? And, and bam, like that, my prayers turn into intercession for the souls of people. And I began begging God not to let people spend eternity without him. I'm not referencing Kobe at all. I know some people who know Kobe. He has spiritual influences in his life. It's not for me to say where he was spiritually. But I began to just pray and intercede. God, don't let people step into eternity without you. And it was a weird experience because I've never prayed like that in that intensity before. And now what, several months later, nine, eight, nine months later, Looking back on this, I think that God gave me a little glimpse into how much he cares for you and for me. And if he cares that deeply and 
infinitely more, shouldn't we care for people that deeply? But here's the problem, at least my problem. I don't like people all the time. <laughs> if you're online, something just happens. It's kind of funny. Just leave it at that. I don't like people all the time. I mean, let's just be honest. I don't like myself all the time. People can be mean. People can be, I'm just going to say it, we can be evil. Look around. Not in the room, but in the world. <laughs> Don't say amen. Look around, amen. That's why we need the Spirit of God. To help us love people as God loves them. To be a place of grace to be a people of grace. Because Jesus, he loves everyone. And he can save anyone. Even when you don't believe in God, he believes in you. Our mission is inviting people into meaningful relationship with God and each other. And here's what I want to do. For everyone online and everyone in the room, I want to invite you to begin a meaningful relationship with God. I certainly hope that there are many here in the room and online who've yet to make that decision. But the invitation stands. The invitation remains. And even if you choose not to believe today, the invitation is for you. Would you bow your heads and let us have just a moment of, of prayer? Father God, I pray that you'd speak to us now by your spirit, that you'd stir our hearts and our minds and set our affection on you, Lord. Wherever we may be in the spectrum of faith or unbelief, God, I pray that right now you would get our attention. And with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, I just want to give you an invitation. Give your life to Christ it doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter what you've done. You could have even gotten kicked out of a KISS concert and God still loves you and gave himself as a ransom for you too. And so what I want to do is I want to invite all of us in this room to pray aloud, to pray aloud to support those of you who are going to join us in this prayer. And this is a prayer of surrender, of giving our life, our soul, our future, our eternity to the hands of our creator, Jesus Christ. And if that's your heart's desire, let's pray this and let's all pray together to say, Father God, today I give my life to you. Jesus, forgive me of my sin. Be my savior. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. I believe that you've risen from the dead because you're the son of God. You gave yourself as a ransom for me. And I accept your invitation into a new life. Thank you that I'm saved. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Let's give it up for those who may have made that decision today. Congratulations. <laughs>
uh, on the platform there. If you're in the room, listen, right behind you, there's a room that'll be filled with uh, men and women who love to have conversation, pray over you, answer any questions that you have uh, spiritually or about the church. And uh, I love what Scott said when he said, if people are the mission of God, then people are the mission of his church. And so I would just encourage all of us as we exit today, ask yourself the question, who has God put in my circle that I need to invite into a meaningful relationship with him and with others, all right? Why don't you stand up? Don't forget how we're exiting today with your masks on, and uh, we're gonna go this way. If you're on this side of the room, we're gonna go this way. If you're on this side of the room, if you have children in our kids' area, please, please pick up your kids. All right, we'll see you next time. God bless.